And so uh, we've already covered four certification that's normally covered along with this lecture. Uh, but today we're focusing on the BMP portion of that. And so uh, forestry BMPs are basically nationwide uh, at this point. Um, in some states, they are required. Uh, Washington State, for example, Montana, they have Forest Practices Acts. And so best management practices may be required under those. In all the southern states, they're voluntary. Um, in some parts of the country, like Vermont, for example, uh, apparently they're not comfortable enough with their management practices that they're the best yet. They're merely acceptable management practices. So if you go work in Vermont, they have AMPs. Uh, but really what these BMPs are for, and I, I know many of you have already taken hydro or are taking hydro, um, what, what these are for is uh, a response uh, basically by, by all the state forestry agencies, so Texas Forest Service uh, here in Texas, uh, to the Clean Water Act. And the idea with BMPs is if we can show that on a voluntary basis, we're doing a good job meeting the requirements of the Clean Water Act, then we can avoid a lot of regulation and you won't have to go get a permit every time you want to go put a log deck in. You won't need to go get a permit every time you want to go put a skid trail in, uh, so on and so forth. So by showing that we have a voluntary program that's effective uh, and gets high compliance. Uh, the goal is to basically just show we're doing our jobs well and there's no need for further uh, regulation. So much of the Clean Water Act is regulated by uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. So you can imagine the bureaucracy and the logistical hassles if you had to go get a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers every time you wanted to do anything on a different logging job. Um, there have been some lawsuits over the last few years uh, trying to state that logging roads and logging decks are a point source of pollution and that they need to be permitted under the Clean Water Act. Um, fortunately, as of now, those lawsuits have not been successful um, and we, we don't require permitting for those sort of activities. Um, so BMPs in Texas are going to be very similar to BMPs in Alabama, South Carolina, Virginia, across the South. They're pretty uniform. Um, so here's a link. Uh, you, you can just Google Texas Forestry Best Management Practices. Um, and this about 100, 200 page guidebook is freely available uh, online. So you can download that as a PDF. <clears throat> so if you want to get into it in more detail, that's there and available for you. Okay, so really what we're trying to do with BMPs uh, is we are trying to prevent sediment from getting into creeks. Okay. That's the overall goal. This works really well if you're trying to manage for forest productivity anyway, because if the sediment <clears throat> isn't in your creek, that means the sediment is still soil on your site, and that soil will hold water, nutrients, and help you grow trees. So BMPs are good for water quality, but they're also good for forest productivity. And so regardless of whether you really care about water quality, uh, from a forest production standpoint, these make every bit as much sense to follow. And so there's three basic processes we want to look at with our forestry best management practices uh, that we can influence to minimize getting sediment in, in creeks, streams, and rivers. So we have some treatments we'll use that will prevent sediment from detaching from where it is. Uh, there are some treatments we use that are going to prevent sediment from being transported to a stream. And then there are some that we'll use to cause that sediment to deposit before it can reach the stream. So that's really all that we're doing with all these complex BMPs. So here's a few examples of detachment BMPs where you're trying to prevent sediment from detaching. Um, <clears throat> and so if we look here, you can see this gravel on the road, okay? Um, if a raindrop hits sand or, or silt, less so clay, but to some extent clay, um, that energy can translate into detaching that particle of soil and it can then move into the ditch and eventually run into the creek down at the bottom of the hill. But if you have gravel here, when a raindrop hits a, a piece of gravel, you know, there's not enough energy in that raindrop to move the gravel or do anything to the gravel. So the gravel just sits there and it protects the sediment underneath it. So just the act of putting rock or gravel on a road um, is a big detachment BMP. And here in East Texas, we're fortunate that we have a pretty good oil and gas in industry. Um, lots of uh, gas roads, oil roads out there, and they do a pretty good job putting pretty, pretty large rock on the roads that we can then also use for forestry, so that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> over here you can see road closure is going to be a big deal. 
And so here they're applying seed to a road um, in order to uh, get grass growing or some other herbaceous plant quickly and that the roots of that plant will minimize detachment. So this isn't going to work on a road that's still being trafficked, obviously, but if you're done with the logging job and you're closing out a skid trail um, and it's no longer going to be trafficked on heavily, uh, this might be an opportunity uh, to minimize detachment. <coughs> Um, you, you do want to be careful with this. There's a lot of examples uh, where uh, departments of transportation and other organizations that have been trying to stabilize soil, they've had a good intention, they've been trying to stabilize soil, they'll, they'll put out grasses and other species that aren't native. And so this is, if you do this wrong, this is a good way to spread an invasive pest. Um, but, you know, you just need to think about what seed you're putting out there so you make sure you're not causing more problems than you're solving. Next up, uh, we have BMPs to try and minimize transport. And what you'll notice as we talk about BMPs over and over and over again, we're really talking about roads. We've over, already gone over this a little bit when we talked about clear cutting, but the vast majority of erosion that we get in forestry does not come even in a clear cut from our harvested area. Uh, because when you look at a harvested area, you can see one in this picture up here. Look at this harvested area in the background. Look at this harvested area in the foreground. There's a lot of slash, there's a lot of debris, so that's gonna prevent detachment of sediment. And then we know this is gonna revegetate very quickly no matter what you do. Um, whether you spray it and plant trees, that's revegetating it quickly, or if you just leave it alone around here, it's not gonna stay bare soil for long. You're gonna get all sorts of vegetation growing there. And so uh, we know the harvest area is not our problem, we know the roads are our problem. And so if you want to prevent transportation of sediment on roads, the name of the game is getting the water off the road. And so we have all sorts of different structures you can get into like this wing ditch here, a broad base dip down here that are intended to move water off a road because the sooner you get the water off the road, the less opportunity you, you have to transport that sediment down the road. Now, when we think about how water works, it's gonna have more energy when it's moving faster and it has the tendency to move faster when your terrain is steeper. So if you're creating roads and you run them straight up and down a steep hill, there's a really high potential that that road will erode and you'll spend a whole bunch of money repairing it over time. Um, and so, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you, you really need to uh, focus on grading roads correctly, getting the slopes of your roads correct from the get-go. Uh, but then on steeper roads, you're going to need more frequent structures to remove water from the road uh, than you will on a flatter road where you're not gonna have that same velocity of water with that same erosive potential. And then finally, we look at depositing BMPs. Um, so if you've ever, ever been around a construction area in, in an urban area, if you go look at, you know, that they're still stalled out, they have not finished Austin Street since uh, everything got shut down. And so if you go look at construction projects like that, road construction, uh, where they're building housing, anything like that, you tend to see these silt fences put up. It's just uh, a plastic fabric, basically, um, and it's intended to catch sediment uh, and get it to deposit before it can go into the road or into the creek or somewhere where you don't want it to go. And so this is very common in urban areas. Uh, typically, we're not going to use that in our forestry operations. Uh, what we'll do in our forestry operations is simply manage for a streamside management zone, an SMZ, and that vegetation that you've left beside the stream uh, does a very effective job, typically, of catching sediment before it enters the stream. Now, SMZs aren't perfect. Um, you can have a pretty good SMZ across 95, 99% of your stream. You can see the clear cut in the background to the left up there. Um, but if there's one punch through, so an area where you've had gully erosion and that gully has eroded through your SMZ into the stream, you can still get a lot of sediment in your stream through that one punch through through the SMZ, okay? So even if your SMZ is working well by and large, there can be specific areas uh, that are causing more problems with SMZs. Yeah, Keenan. Do contractors have to do something special with the sediment that's attached or like fell, falls into the fences or is it just kind of like pull them up and let let them go? Um, I, I don't know <clears throat> from um, 
uh, an urban context, what they necessarily have to do is just regular contractors. Now, if um, you're building a structure and you are taking a designated wetland, uh, so say, you know, years ago they wanted to build uh, the baseball stadium uh, right where the trails and gardens are right now. But where the trails and gardens are on campus, that's a jurisdictional wetland under the Clean Water Act. And so if you build in a jurisdictional wetland, you can do it. You just need to negotiate with the Army Corps of Engineers and they will set up a mitigation permit where you have to mitigate your take of those wetlands. And you can do that in a number of different ways. Um, one way you can do that is by creating wetlands in a nearby area. Um, but, you know, companies, big builders don't want to go around and create wetlands. That's not their specialty. So another way they commonly do it is you can buy credits from a nearby wetland mitigation bank. And what a wetland mitigation bank is, um, is they usually employ foresters. Um, and it's uh, folks who have bought a bunch of wetlands and they've got it set up where they can improve those wetlands. And they've negotiated with the Army Corps of Engineers and they're doing something, they're killing tallow or doing something to improve the quality of those wetlands. That generates so many mitigation banking credits and they can sell the credit then on a market to the developers. Um, so that's some of how development is handled, but Keenan, whether they have to go dig this out and put it back, um, the Corps of Engineers would regulate that if it was related to a jurisdictional wetland, but if it's not, um, I, I don't know what organization might um, regulate that or enforce any sort of restrictions. It, it might just be building codes um, and uh, handled at the local city level. Um, that's possible. So, Okay, and again, we'll, we'll see this over and over and over again. Uh, the story here is about roads. So cutting trees, little impact on, on um, erosion especially in an operation like this where they may be felling a few trees by chainsaw and not even have big equipment out there. That's just, that's not where you're going to find uh, the major impact uh, on erosion. Um, so a lot of work has been done on BMPs over the last 40, 50 years. And uh, a lot of it has come down to good pre-harvest planning. Um, if you go to work for any of the large timber management companies, and you end up working in their harvesting unit, um, what, what, a lot of what your job is in those harvesting units is you're working with your contractors who are your loggers. And so you're getting loggers out on tracks of timber that you've bought and you're getting them to harvest those tracks of timber. And generally how that process works, and this will work, be the same for consultants when they're getting a property logged, is you'll meet with the loggers on site. Uh, usually you'll go over maps. Um, and for the big companies, they'll often have stipulations in that harvest contract where they have to implement BMPs. Um, they may have other stipulations like that. They will give them maps that show where the streams are, uh, areas they need to leave as an SMZ, areas they're not logging. They may have the logging or the SMZs, they may have them flagged off. Um, a lot of these big companies have specialized flagging that says SMZ on it that they give to their foresters. So they may flag the SMZs. They might paint the SMZs. Uh, so that the loggers know where they are, but they'll go out and they're basically doing pre-harvest planning. And so th this is really how a lot of BMPs end up getting implemented. But with pre-harvest planning, there's a lot of other advantages. And really this is just getting a map in the forester's hand or in the logger's hand uh, so they can see the nature of the tract and how to best operate on it. And so th they did a study on this, uh, I believe the study was out of Virginia. And with pre-harvest training of loggers, this is specific training of loggers, they found two major changes. Uh, the loggers use topo maps more, and in parts of Virginia where it's mountainous, that can make a big difference. Um, less of an issue a little bit around here where we have much flatter topography. Uh, you can see some 2,000 foot elevation lines on this topo map, for instance. Um, and then they really plan for their stream crossings a lot better. And again, stream crossings are basically a punch through of the SMZ. So a stream crossing is an area where if you're going to get sediment in the stream, that is where it is 100% most likely to occur. Um, it's where your stream is being crossed by the road. That's a huge area for sediment into the stream. Uh, well, what they found is the BMP implementation was good across the board. The untrained loggers were still implementing BMPs 86% of the time. The trained loggers did a little bit better of a job, 
The landowners were pretty happy across the board, 80% satisfaction, but that went up to 87.5% satisfaction uh, with the trained group of loggers. And then this bottom line is really how you sell it to loggers. Logging is a high volume, low margin business. So for loggers to make money, they have to move a lot of wood and they have to operate as much as they can. And so uh, the downtime that they had when it got too wet to operate on the tract, uh, for the control group of loggers, they lost more than a month a year, but that basically added eight work days a year with this trading. And it's pretty straightforward why it happened. Uh, the trained group looked at topo maps before they went and laid out skid trails and roads on sites, and they did a better job putting them in. And that meant that when it did get wet, because they put their roads in correctly and they put in as few stream crossings as possible, and they put those in good places, they could still operate on that site for a little bit longer before they had to shut down. Whereas the folks that just went in there without training, didn't look at a map beforehand, they just winged it. Um, they ended up, once it started raining, they hadn't put their roads in as best they could. And so they got too wet and they had to shut down earlier. And so that's how, so you can sell it to, to loggers by just saying you're gonna work more with a little bit of training. You can sell it to landowners. Um, uh, they're going to be happier, and then it, it's working well from a regulatory standpoint as well for state agencies. Um, so pre-harvest training is a big deal. It's, it's going to help a lot. Um, all the southern states have various logger training programs. Uh, we have a logger training program here uh, managed through our Texas Forestry Association, TFA, uh, with their head offices right there by the Forestry Museum in Lufkin. Um, we have a, a Texas Pro Logger Council here uh, in Texas. And if you go to one of the annual TFA meetings, um, each year they'll give out a logger of the year award to loggers that are doing a really good job. So there's a lot of loggers that are really interested in this sort of uh, uh, stuff just because they want to be good at their job, just like we all want to be good at our jobs. So uh, in terms of getting water off the road, there's a lot of different structures out there that people have tried over the years. Um, I've even seen examples where people have taken guardrails uh, from beside a road, uh, unused guardrails. And if you look at a guardrail, it's basically just a gutter. It's a long U-shaped piece of metal. They've buried those in the ground and thrown gravel in it to get water off the road. Um, I've seen examples uh, where people have taken uh, thick rubber mats. Think of a material like a mud flap on a, a big truck. Um, and they've sort of buried those in the road so you can drive back and forth over them. It's not an impediment, but it stays up vertical and it shunts water off the road. People have tried all sorts of stuff uh, to get water off of roads. Uh, the first thing you can look at really is your road template. So how is your road going to be designed um, relative to the topography? There's a few different options here. Um, sometimes uh, in East Texas, we have through fills. Um, think about the tram road lab, right? Uh, we drove the vans on a road that looked very much like this and there was a swamp on this side, there was a swamp on this side. And so through fill is gonna be pretty common in a bottom land. Through fill is not great from a hydrological standpoint because while this is a road that you can drive on, this is also a very long linear dam. And so you've raised the water table on one side of it and you've lowered the water table on the other side of it. Uh, if you're ever driving around and see new road construction and see a whole bunch of trees that are dead, uh, you may be seeing an issue where they've altered the hydrology in an area and caused either too much water that drowned the trees or caused too little water and basically kill them uh, through drought mechanisms. Um, if you go into more mountainous parts of the country, they'll often have a through cut like this, where basically you're driving down a road in the bottom of a valley, or if you're in Kentucky, it's a hauler, but same thing. And the stream will be right here beside the road, small mountain streams. And so you end up with an op operation like that. Most typically what you see low is roads are run along a contour. There's some amount of slope and roads are run along a contour and you've got three different options. You could put in a flat road like this, a full bench. We rarely see that done because the water would just pond up on it. It's not gonna work well. So realistically, you have two options. You can inslope your road or you can outslope your road. And they have different pros and cons. An outsloped road works great because water rolls onto your road, water rolls across your road, and water rolls down your road. An outsloped road is not ideal if you're driving down this and it's been raining a lot or it's further north and you've got snow or ice on the road because while water can roll down the hill across the road and down the hill, uh, whatever you're driving can also slide down the hill and then roll down the hill. 
Um, so these are not the safest, um, especially in really steep terrain where if you go off that hill, you could be going for hundreds of feet uh, down a, a really steep slope. So outsloping is simple from a water management standpoint, not ideal from a safety standpoint. This is uh, more ideal from a safety standpoint because ice, snow, or, or rain, um, if you start sliding on this, your van slides into the uphill side and you know you, you may bust an axle or you know part of your suspension uh, depending on how deep that ditch is but nobody dies uh, you're just right here beside the road you haven't gone the other way but from a water standpoint this is more complicated right because water hits the road and it rolls into this ditch it rolls down this hill and into this ditch and then this ditch is kind of stuck right think about the road going into and coming out of the screen you're starting to accumulate more and more water over here. At some point, you have to get the water from that ditch out over here onto the downhill side of the road. So the most common way that's done is you put in a culvert. Uh, and if you're not familiar with culverts, it's just a pipe. All a culvert is is a pipe. You can make them out of cement, you can make them out of plastic, you can make them out of metal. Uh, they're generally pretty expensive, but it's just a big pipe. You bury it under the road. If you put enough soil on top of it, you can drive on top of it without damaging a culvert and that pipe comes out. Culverts, beyond being expensive, they do require maintenance. They will fill up with vegetation, so you may have to clean them out periodically. Uh, if they're installed improperly, they can start getting crushed in, uh, and then they're not gonna work effectively. And the other thing you need to think about where the culvert comes out on the downhill side of the road, you don't want a big pipe sticking up here and being three feet up in the air, because then the water coming out of it will fall like a little waterfall, and you'll end up causing erosion at the base of it. So you want the culvert coming out with ideally not too much drop there. And then you may have to put large rock or other material right under the mouth of the culvert so that you're not causing erosion where your culvert emerges on this hill. Um, so more expensive, more maintenance, but much safer for an in-sloped road template. <clears throat> uh, we've all probably seen water bars. We've all probably driven over water bars in labs, right? This is just where you make a speed bump out of dirt. Rain comes down the road, hits it, and moves off to the side of the road. These are really not intended for anything more than a skid trail because if you put these on a road and we drive over them over and over and over again, well, they break down. And once they break down, they don't do anything, okay? So a water bar might be a temporary fix on a skid trail. So they're done logging here. They've got this skid trail. Uh, most skidders have a little dozer blade on the front of them. So the skidder could even push this up itself. So you push it up there, it keeps gully erosion from forming on this road. And then if you leave it alone and you really get traffic off this skid trail, well, all this revegetates. And once it revegetates, you no longer need the water bar. So all those roots are gonna hold down your soil and fix any erosion potential you've got there. <coughs> Another option is a rolling dip and you can see it right here. And so the idea with the rolling dip is you may have an in-sloped road template. So it's sloped into the uphill side and you've got a ditch. And then it, at some point, instead of putting a culvert in, uh, you simply outslope the road for a brief period and you do this on a low point. So the water will flow down the road and into that, down the ditch and into that, and then off to the other side of the road. Um, a rolling dip is relatively short. So log trucks are gonna have trouble going over it. It's not ideal for log trucks. Um, but if you had just a, a small road uh, that you're mostly using small vehicles on, um, that might be one option. You gotta be careful with these because these can be steep enough that if you gunned a van over it, you might get uh, three or four wheels off the ground. Uh, so you, you really don't wanna go through these too fast. <clears throat> Our next option is a water turnout, like a wing ditch. Um, and this is just some way uh, where you create some channel off to the side of the road uh, where your water's gonna come out. Of course, the challenge with this is you don't want to cause gully erosion off the side of your road because that will eat headward back towards your road. And then you've got a big ditch in the middle of your road and it's difficult to, to drive on. And so with these water turnouts, you may want to throw a bunch of slash in them, debris to prevent erosion, big rocks, lots of options. And of course, these things are going to fill up with sediment over time. So this requires some maintenance as well. Uh, one thing we've seen a lot across East Texas, of course, a lot of our forest land used to be owned by Temple Inland. Well, Temple Inland owned the mills, they owned the land, they had reasons to invest in a good road network. Um, some land uh, in the West Gulf region is now owned by companies like Weyerhaeuser um, or Rainier, where they are real estate investment trusts, REITs. 
And those REITs plan to own land and manage land for a long time because they also do own some mills. And so they're looking at a plan where they own the land for a while. And because of that, they will invest in roads and you have good roads um, on those areas. However, what we've seen is a number of companies are TMOs, Timberland Investment Management Organizations. Campbell Global, we just saw an example of that, where Campbell Global owned half a million acres. They owned it for about 10, 15 years, and then they sold it to Catchmark, and it's being managed by FRC now. So a lot of these TMOs, the plan is own the land for about 15 years um, and make money off the land by harvesting timber, but they also are planting trees. They're doing good silviculture because they're trying to plan to improve the quality of the land to sell it for more money than they bought it for. And so they're making money a variety of different ways, but they have a short time frame that they're planning on. So they're looking at about a 15 year window. Well, if you only plan on owning land for 15 years, your philosophy towards road maintenance becomes, let's fix what we need to, to do what we need to do, and the rest of it, we're not gonna do much. And so the road networks on a lot of these lands that we've seen in East Texas that are going through the hands of TMOs like Hancock and FRC now, they're not being maintained probably to the same quality that they once were under the vertically integrated forest products companies. And so the, the roads just seem to get worse and worse. Uh, and we're of course in a part of country where road maintenance, road maintenance is always expensive, but road maintenance is very difficult around here um, because we don't have a lot of rock in a lot of our areas that we can pull to put on roads. You've got to transport it long distances, which is therefore expensive. We get a lot of rain, like we saw yesterday. And so we'll, we'll get a lot of erosion and a lot of water on our roads and they're difficult to maintain for those reasons. So road maintenance is, is kind of tricky. We talked about this briefly uh, when we talked uh, about mechanical site prep, uh, where you'll often have roads like you see in the upper right here with these long ditches beside them. Uh, ditching is now illegal under the Clean Water Act to drain a wetland, but if you have historic ditches like this or legal ditches that are just uh, water structures near roads, but they're not draining a wetland, um, you'll need to maintain those um, so that they don't sediment up. And often in a road template like this, periodically you will have culverts to allow water to move from one side of the road to the other. And so you'll need to maintain those as well. And so you can see why culverts are expensive. Just buying a culvert, a, a giant pipe made out of metal or cement, that's gonna cost you hundreds uh, or low thousands of dollars. They're expensive. And then you've gotta get big equipment out and big equipment is expensive to move around. It's expensive to use. And so roads can literally cost you millions of dollars uh, a mile to maintain. Uh, so that they end up being very expensive. One option uh, that works uh, around here, it works further north. Uh, further north, it helps you melt snow or ice and make your roads trafficable. Uh, around here, it will dry out your roads quicker after a rain event and make them more trafficable. But it's just called daylighting a road. And all that means is you cut the timber near the road. And so by cutting the timber near the road, you get more light on the road. And hopefully the road right here would dry out more quickly than the road back over here where it's gonna be shaded by the adjacent timber. So. That's an option. Um, I've already talked about with some structures like water bars, the key is gonna be closing your site. Um, and the challenge is closing any site uh, anywhere where we've got forested land. And so they did a study, this was in West Virginia, um, and one to eight years uh, after a harvest, they came back, they looked at the harvest job, and what they found is the harvest areas were great. They were recovering, there was little sedimentation uh, issues there but the roads and skid trails were still eroding. You know, eight years after a harvest, you would think the skid trails would be in good shape, but they weren't because people were getting in there. They were getting in there on off-road vehicles, ATVs, uh, UTVs, whatever you want to call them. Um, and they were driving around and it was causing erosion problems. Um, and so we know, uh, you know, a, a gate is really just, uh, you know, kind of like a road sign. Uh, if you want to get past a gate, you can get past a gate. There, there's no perfect gate. Uh, you know, locks are only for honest people, right? Um, when I was at Virginia Tech, we went out, they just put a new gate up um, and they had actually, uh, they had some problems in this area. So they had taken pretty thick steel pipe and they'd filled it with cement. Uh, and they had put that up as their gate and they'd done it like the week before. And by the time we got out there, it was already halfway cut through. I guess someone had been grinding through it. They'd worn through whatever grinder they had and they had left, or maybe they ran out of beer, one or the other, uh, gone out to get more supplies and hadn't finished the job yet, but it was clear they were gonna come back and finish it. So 
So there's no gate you can put up that, you know, people can't get past. So closure is not practical from that standpoint. But there's a lot you can do from a societal basis uh, to help with road closure. And so uh, there's one good example from Warehouser up in southeast Oklahoma and Arkansas. They bought some land up there. And there were people that had been going out and hunting on this land for generations. Um, and Warehouser left the land open initially, uh, but they ran into too many problems where people were just dumping a bunch of trash, uh, doing other dumb stuff. It was causing issues. So they started putting gates up. And as soon as they started putting gates up, two things happened. One, all their gates started getting pulled out. And two, people started setting the woods on fire, left and right. Uh, so they had a lot of problems with arson. Uh, well, what they did uh, it, to solve this, and it's taken a long time. They've, they've had arson problems until very recently, so it's taken quite a time to resolve. But um, they, they started building a strong hunting lease program. So now, you know, you're not going out there and burning warehouser's land. You're going out there and you're burning your buddy or your neighbor's hunting lease. And so people are less likely to commit arson. But then the other thing is they don't have warehouser gates anymore. When you lease that land for hunting, one of the stipulations on the lease is that you're responsible for installing the gate. You have to install it to warehouser specs um, and with, of course, the, the warehouser lock on there and everything. But now when they're going out there, you're not ripping out a warehouser gate or damaging warehouser property. Uh, you're, again, damaging your neighbor's property. And that pretty much uh, overnight stopped a lot of the problems that they were having um, with gates. <clears throat> so we have a lot of land that's leased for hunting here in East Texas. And that, that's a very good societal fix to access uh, because then you've got the people that are leasing that land uh, that are going to have some uh, pride in it, stewardship over it, and they're going to help you regulate access because they're not going to want people that, you know, aren't paying for that lease to be out there. And so our hunting club infrastructure that we have and all our lease land uh, that we have uh, here uh, in the West Gulf actually works pretty well for uh, preventing a lot of access issues that we might have otherwise. Okay, um, so stream crossings. Again, I already mentioned this. Stream crossings are a major potential to get sediment into stream. Uh, there's a lot of different types of stream crossings. And so here you see a couple examples. Uh, so this is a small bridge. Um, with, with bridges, the downside is how much weight will that bridge hold? Well, I, I can't tell you. You probably don't have a good answer. You need an engineer. So a civil engineer can tell you how much weight that bridge can hold. And so a, a bridge is an engineered uh, you know, structure. And so that adds some complexity to it. Um, but if you look at this bridge, you can see there's still, you know, right where the bridge crosses, there's some potential to get some sediment in the stream, but it, it's considerably less. Down here is a culvert. The nice thing with a culvert is if you put enough dirt over the top of it, you don't need an engineer involved. Um, it should be able to take just about any load over the top of that. Um, they'll use culvert crossings uh, on military bases, for example, uh, where they drive tanks across. Um, and so tanks will weigh, you know, two or three times what a log truck fully loaded will weigh, uh, so much heavier. <clears throat> um, the downside with a culvert crossing, if you look at this culvert crossing, this causes a lot of sediment in the stream, right? For a very simple reason. You've placed this pipe in the stream and then what did you do? You bulldozed a whole bunch of dirt directly into the stream around that culvert. And so culvert crossings are going to cause sedimentation when you first install them. Um, hopefully you get enough large rock around it and you've installed the inflow and outlet correctly so that uh, over time that sedimentation is going to decrease. Uh, but the advantage there is it, it's not an engineered structure. There's a few other options here. Uh, some loggers will have skitter bridges, uh, basically just giant metal bridges, and they'll move these from job to job. Very commonly what you see around here is that loggers will use uh, crane mats for this purpose. And so we have a lot of companies, if you look at the, some of you at Field Station may have gone to Angelina Forest Products. And so that's the sawmill there, I believe east of Lufkin. Uh, and right by them, they're putting in a uh, mass timber facility. And what that mass timber facility is gonna do is they're gonna take two by fours from the sawmill, pine two by fours that you can make from relatively small trees, and they're gonna make crane mats. Um, and we see a lot of crane mats used around here in the oil and gas industry because they can put them down, they can drive on them any time of year, um, and then they're not gonna rut up the soil and they're not gonna get their vehicles stuck. The other place you see crane mats commonly used uh, a couple of years ago, 
uh, they went and uh, I don't know what company it was, uh, but they upgraded the power transmission lines, the big lines that run by like the, the northern part uh, of the Lenana Creek Trail. They upgraded those throughout town. Um, and as you saw the big equipment they needed to do that, they were putting up much larger uh, poles to carry those high, high transmission lines. Uh, they, they were using a lot of crane mats because those were sites right by the creek and they didn't want to get their dozers or anything stuck. So they were putting down a lot of crane mats and driving on them. So a lot of loggers will bring a crane mat, just basically a giant wooden mat, and they'll set it down here and you can drive across those um, as an impromptu stream crossing. Uh, you don't see these as much in the south. You'll see them in areas where they've got small headwater streams and mountainous areas, but they'll just throw a bunch of pulp wood in the stream and then they'll throw like a drill pipe in there or something. And then you can drive across that. And at the end of the job, you may, you know, pull that pulp wood out and throw it in the middle of the load. <laughs> uh, so it's not as obvious until it gets to the mill. Uh, so you, you may see that done occasionally. That's temporary. Some parts of the, the country, they'll have Fords. Uh, for small streams around here, this is what we use, a Ford. And a Ford just means you drive right across the stream. Uh, this, this particular example here is a reinforced Ford where they've thrown a mat, a wooden mat down into the Ford uh, there. Uh, technically with Fords, you ideally want a rock bottom stream for these. So that may work in central Texas, but in East Texas, we don't really have rock bottom streams. Um, and then the downside to a Ford is, once the water's high enough, you know, every time there's flash flooding, you hear the local news people saying it only takes four inches of water to float a school bus or whatever, because um, water can have a lot of energy. And so we, we see the same thing with a Ford, where if you get enough rainfall, uh, the water starts moving across it too quickly, and you end up with erosion. And more importantly, you just can't drive across it. It's not passable. So stream crossings are all expensive. That's why I've got the dollar signs and the S's there. And these are some examples of relatively low cost stream crossings. If you put in an actual bridge, that's tens of thousands of dollars minimum. And again, so the stream crossing is a big potential for erosion. Cam, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, so with some of the tracks that we cruise, um, on some of the larger creeks, they use like flatbeds from semis. Right. When they, when they install those type of uh, large bridges, is that just for, is that temporary while the logging job is taking place, or is there do they have to remove it by a certain amount of time after the job's completed? Um, I believe, especially on a larger stream, if you put in any sort of crossing like a bridge, I think you have to get it permitted through the Corps of Engineers. Um, so those, those may be temporary structures, of course, depending on the land, you know, it's not like the Corps of Engineers is out there surveying land, looking for illegal structures or anything like that. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of redneck engineering going on. Uh, Grogan's a real big fan of using shipping containers. You throw a shipping container on a big stream and then drive across the top of it. So uh, whenever you talk stream crossings with Grogan, he usually brings that up. So, um, so I'm sure there's lots of stuff like that going on. Uh, some of them probably technically aren't legal, but uh, they may be effective. And then in terms of uh, the, the logging crew, it's going to vary logger to logger, um, how they maintain their equipment um, and what their philosophy is on that, uh, whether they're going to bother dragging crane mats or, you know, other things that could be used as bridges around. Okay. Um, the, the other thing with stream crossings, um, so again, that, that's a major potential for erosion because that's right where the road crosses the stream. But what they found in recent years is it's not just right where the road crosses the stream that you need to focus on, it's how the road approaches that stream crossing. So say you've got relatively steep terrain and you've run a road straight down that steep terrain right to a stream crossing, and then you start getting gully erosion on that road, all that sediment's going right into your stream at the bottom of the hill. So really that road that approaches the stream, you need to have good water control structures on it to get the water off the road before that water can put sediment into the stream. So it's not just the crossing itself, but the approach to the crossing that can make a major difference. So it's not a matter of just putting up an SMZ and saying, hey, we're done, we've got it covered. Uh, these areas like stream crossings, you really wanna focus on. And then the other thing with a stream crossing, Ideally, you want it to be straight across the stream. You want a 90 degree angle. You don't want to angle it across the stream because if you do that, uh, then it's just longer than it needs to be and you've impacted more length of the bank than you really needed to impact. 
Um, so SMZs, you guys have already heard a bunch about SMZs in our program. You, you already know a lot about SMZs. There have been a ton of studies on SMZs and the take home message in every SMZ study is that SMZs work. Um, and you really don't need much of an SMZ for SMZs to work. So every study they've ever done where they had an area without an SMZ and an area with an SMZ, the area with the SMZ is better. So we figured that out in forestry. That's really not controversial in forestry. You will see a lot of agricultural areas and notice this as you're driving around uh, where you see cows down in the creek and there may just be gully erosion right through a, a big pasture with a stream running through a pasture and there's not a tree to be seen near it. And so, um, you know, there's still a push to try and get the ag folks to buy into the idea that trees aren't necessarily bad, uh, that they can really help some things like that. And then here's one slide with the breakdown for you, but just remember uh, that our Texas uh, forestry best management practices, uh, you're gonna want an SMZ on streams that are perennial and intermittent. And those are streams that are flowing more than 30% of the year. Um, so those streams are gonna be streams that are probably flowing right now. Um, and uh, they may not be flowing in the middle of the summer, right? An intermittent stream in July and August may not be flowing. Um, it used to be 50% canopy cover you needed in SMZ, but that was hard to regulate, right? Uh, because 50%, that's hard to eyeball, 50% compared to what? Um, so they switched it to 50 square feet per acre of basal area because you can do that real easy with a prism real quick, uh, not, as, not as complicated to assess. Um, and you want 50 feet, so 50 and 50, 50 square feet per acre, 50 feet either side of the stream. Uh, ephemeral streams carry water less than 30% of the year. So ephemeral streams, you know, two or three days from now after that rain we had yesterday, they're going to be dry. You don't need an SMZ on those. Keep in mind, with these recommendations, this is basically the minimum you can do and be compliant with BMPs. You can absolutely do more than this. So look at this picture on the right. We've got pretty steep terrain right here leading to a stream, right? Well, with steep terrain, we know water moves faster and has more potential for erosion, right? More energy. And so on steep terrain like this, you may need more than a 50 foot SMZ. And there's nothing in BMP saying you can't go more than 50, okay? You could leave more than 50 square feet per acre of basal area. Um, there's a lot of different options there. So you can always go wider. Depending on your landowner objective, think way back before spring break when we did wildlife friendly pine plantations, and some of your groups ended up with newts and, or other organisms that you know, weren't as uh, consistent with the structures and composition of a pine plantation from a habitat standpoint. If you've got a landowner that wants something like that, make them have 100 foot SMZ, something like that. If it meets, meets your landowner objectives, you can go wider. Um, you, you do need to focus on that SMZ with low in relation to the objective. So when you look at these timber management companies, the SMZ really isn't meeting their objectives. They're leaving them. They, they don't want to cause poor water quality and they certainly don't want to lose productivity on their site by losing their soil. Um, but, you know, they may have about 13% of their property in SMZs. So if you ask them, why don't you go wider on the SMZs? Well, then across half a million acres, 13% is a lot of acres, right? Um, and if you suddenly expand those dramatically, now you're looking at 25% of the acreage in SMZs that, that's not going to meet their landowner objectives. So you need to link the SMZ width there to the landowner objectives. Um, we've already discussed how SMZs, you can treat them as their own stand, or you could integrate them into a prescription within um, that stand. It's just sort of a special designated area within the stand. Uh, and this, this will vary a little bit state to state. Um, in Oklahoma, for example, um, they've got a program where you can pull all the pine you want off the SMZ, even if you drop the basal area below their recommended level. Uh, providing you're converting that SMZ back to hardwood. So they're, they've had too much pine planted in their SMZs historically. They'd like them converted more back to a natural state, which is hardwood. And so they've got kind of an exemption built in there right now uh, to allow companies to pull pine out of the SMZs. So they're more of a hardwood cover type. So we've been focused heavily on roads and that's, you know, that's probably two thirds of the BMP handbook. They do have other stuff in there. Um, obviously, when you're doing mechanical site prep, there's a big potential for erosion. You need some BMPs there. Chemical site prep, uh, so herbicides, you need BMPs for that. If you're following the label on herbicides, you're probably compliant with BMPs. Um, so the BMPs here aren't anything uh, that unreasonable. 
there's being peace for fire. Of course, we know that if you have a fire that, that needs containment, uh, a wildfire, a catch out, um, that the first priority is uh, safety and property, and then we'll worry about BMPs after. So if they're, they're fighting a fire and they need to put in a fire line and it needs to run straight up and down a hill, uh, TFS is gonna get on the dozer and run it straight up and down the hill. They'll put it where it needs to be put. Uh, but once the fire's contained and that immediate threat to, to life and property is gone, um, you need to get back out there and start thinking about BMPs because you basically just built a, a road in a place that wasn't ideal from a erosion standpoint. So you need to start thinking about that after the fact. Um, when, when we're talking fire, if you're putting in fire lines where there's not currently a fire, you're just planning for fire on your landscape, think of fire lines as roads. Um, so you probably want to try and avoid putting them in straight and up and down a hill if you can. Uh, there are some harvesting BMPs out there, and we've already talked about this a little bit uh, with uh, our mechanical site prep lecture, lecture 12. Uh, there are harvest systems where you have wider low ground pressure tires. Uh, you could go to shovel logging systems where they have the excavator style body with the boom arm with the feller head on it, swamp logging systems. In extreme examples, you could have an area helicopter logged uh, where you just have people on the ground uh, felling trees with chainsaws and then attaching chokers from the helicopter to the tree. So that's causing very little soil disturbance on your site. Um, the problem is helicopters are extremely expensive uh, and hand felling trees on the ground is extremely dangerous. Uh, and then flying trees around with helicopters, also not the safest thing you could be doing. So there's some safety issues with that system. Um, you'll see this used in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Southeast Alaska, for example, where they fell big trees and the helicopter chokes them and picks them up. So think species like Sitka spruce. But then what they're doing is they're just dropping them uh, in the ocean nearby, putting them together in large rafts and uh, using tugs to get those large rafts into a sawmill that's right there on the coast. Um, so it's real high value timber and that's how they make that make sense. Uh, species like Western red cedar. Um, but uh, the other place I've seen this used in the east is where large municipalities uh, may be managing a watershed for water quality. And so they need to do some timber harvest there. If it's a large municipality and you've got millions of people paying their water bill, you may have the resources there to lose money on a harvest operation, but still have it meet your landowner objective there, which is uh, protecting the water quality first and foremost. Um, on that forest. So, uh, but really what you want to avoid is what you see on the bottom. A lot of rutting, you know, that's, that's not what you want to see. Um, there are BMPs for intermediate operations. You know, if you're doing a thinning, you need roads. So you need skid trails, right? So that all is going to apply throughout. Uh, so there are other BMPs. TSI is a timber stand improvement. So that's a type of thin. Uh, so um, and then we've already talked about this a little bit, but uh, when you get to the federal level, uh, the Clean Water Act, that's, that's in designated wetlands, regulatory wetlands, uh, the federal BMPs are going to apply through the Clean Water Act. The nice thing is we have what's called a silvicultural exemption. So if you're doing pretty much anything we've learned in class this semester on a designated wetland, you're good. It falls under the silvicultural exemption. So basically you just need to have an ongoing silvicultural operation. You're doing normal silviculture. You're not out there clear cutting a wetland and planting eucalyptus or something like that, right? Um, and then you're following the state BMPs, maybe a few other federal regulations here and there. You're not doing things that are gonna alter hydrology. So you're not ditching, which we already talked about. And you may have to be a little bit more careful with how you're applying your herbicides, no introduction of toxins. Um, so if you look, basically that just means you need an herbicide that is labeled for application in a wetland situation. Um, so a common uh, chemical that we'll use in forestry might be a cord. A cord is glyphosate. Glyphosate's the active ingredient. But a cord is not labeled for application to a wetland. Uh, we were doing a research project a few years ago. Um, we wanted to apply oust, sulfmetron but you can't apply sulfmetron at all to water. It, it, it's a soil active herbicide. It'll move with water, cause all sorts of problems. And our site was flooded during our application window. Uh, we were trying to apply it for hardwood regeneration. And so you can't put sulfmetron out there for oaks um, once they've broken bud. So on these wetland sites we had, um, the site was flooded and the trees broke bud. So there was no window to apply sulfmetron that year. 
So we knew we had to go with glyphosate, spot applications around our seedlings to try and get them to survive. Uh, we knew we couldn't apply chemicals like Accord because they weren't labeled for wetlands. So we found a product called Makazi. Makazi was labeled for application to wetlands and it's the same 41% glyphosate product. Um, so if you are working in a wetland, you just need to make sure whatever herbicides you are applying are labeled for wetland application. There's even chemicals. Uh, Rodeo is a trade name of a chemical. Rodeo is glyphosate that you can apply directly to water, for example. Um, so some of these chemicals you can apply to water. Um, you just need to make sure they're labeled that way. Um, around here in East Texas, applying glyphosate to water probably isn't going to be too effective in many cases. Uh, because keep in mind, glyphosate binds tightly to any clay, okay? So if you have water that's kind of brown in color, it's probably full of clay. Glyphosate's not going to do much there, right? Because it's going to bind to the clay before it can give you much control. Um, so applying glyphosate to water that's brown, there, there's really not much point to it. Um, and then you need a permit from the Corps of Engineers to convert a bottomland type to a pine plantation. But more importantly, that's probably a site that should be planted in pine anyway. You're gonna have a lot of trouble with your pine surviving on those sites. So, you know, that, that may not be the best silvicultural choice regardless of any regulations. Uh, BMPs are really a success story. Um, they've, there's lots of documentation out there that they've improved water quality. Uh, they've improved wildlife habitat, right? You know, if you've got species like turkey that needs some hardwood, uh, they've created corridors of hardwood throughout our whole landscape, right? Uh, they're good from a, a timber production standpoint because they keep our soil on our site. Um, the public's a fan of them. Professional societies, foresters, loggers, they're a fan of BMPs. Loggers get to work longer. Um, and because we're doing such a good job with BMPs, these lawsuits that come through where they're trying to make logging activities a point source of pollution, they're being defeated because we're doing a good job showing that our BMPs are effective they work and they're working as a voluntary system right now in many states. So, so BMPs are a pretty good success story. Uh, lots of evidence to back that up. And then this last slide, um, I'll upload these slides for you. That's sort of the process as a forester that you might go through. And I know you guys get into this in more in hydrology uh, where you might go through this process to get BMPs implemented on your site. Um, of course, this is going to depend on the logger you're working with. If you've been working with a logger for a long time, uh, you may be, you know, pretty comfortable that they always do a good job where they put their log decks and their skid trails. And at that point, you may not worry about marking those out. Uh, but if you've got a new logger, you may want to work with them a little closely for a while just to make sure you as the forester are on the same page with what they're doing um, and that they're, they're not causing any problems there. But yeah, so that's uh, forestry BMPs and really how they, they impact silviculture. I know you get into this in a number of other classes and cover it a lot in hydrology, but any questions on BMPs, anything else?